Hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to my one of my favorite webinar. Um, always very obliging, Dr. Aslani, my friend, um, an expert in echo, trained in Mayo, and uh, done a lot of papers. So I think without further ado, we don't need any um, introduction. Aslani, we start with your first case. All right, so I just share my slides. All right, I hope you all can see my slides. Okay. Can. All right. Uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Betty, for inviting me again for this uh, very popular uh, webinar series of yours. Um, so just as per usual, uh, we're going to share a few interesting echocardiography cases. Um, today, I thought that I share a little bit of a transesophageal echocardiogram. So there are two types of echocardiogram mainly. One is transthoracic echocardiogram, where you scan the patient from outside the heart. Um, another one is what we call a semi-invasive procedure, where you scan the heart from inside the stomach or inside the esophagus upper part of the gullet. Um, this is because uh, the probe is nearer to the heart. And uh, you can see a certain part of the heart better with a transesophageal echocardiogram. So let's go uh, for the, our first, first case. I think this case was uh, in Mayo Clinic. We have a 62 years old man with a uh, metastatically sensitive uh, Staphylococcus aureus, native mitral valve endocarditis, uh, have some complications, including severe mitral vegetation and multiple cerebral infarcts. Um, so he have an IVAP. This is an intravenous uh, uh, pot for chemotherapy uh, for his T cell cutaneous lymphoma. So he was transferred from uh, outside hospital. This is in 2014 with mental status changes, uh, hypotension, and sepsis. So uh, just go straight to the mid esophageal four chamber view of this echocardiogram. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the left ventricle, right ventricle, left atrium, and right atrium here. Um, so this is basically the home view of the transesophageal echocardiogram. So uh, something interesting that I show you here is that you can see that this is the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve. That's the anterior, mitral valve, anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. You can see an abnormal mass here inside the left atrium. In fact, if you go to 60 degree, which is the bicommissural view, so this is the left ventricle, left atrium. So this is the left atrial appendage. Uh, for those of you who are interested, this is where 95% of your clot uh, that uh, occur in the atrial yeah. fibrillation and stroke come from there. That is the left upper pulmonary vein. And that is what we call the warfarin ridge or the comorin ridge, which is the ridge between the left upper pulmonary vein and the left atrial appendage. Um, if you look here in the bicommercial view, so this is the same structure here, and you can see some rounded ring structure there. Um, and uh, some tips to determine which uh, scallop that is involved in uh, mitral valve pathology is that you use your mid-esophageal four-chamber view to determine whether it is a posterior or anterior leaflet problem. So here you can see that this is posterior and this is anterior. So this is an anterior leaflet problem. And this bicommercial view is to determine which scallops are involved. So this is one, two, and three. So because this is anterior and this is two, so this is something wrong in the A2 scallops of the mitral valve. So as you can see here from the color view, there are significant severe mitral regurgitation directed to the opposite direction of that mass in the mitral valve. And this is a 3D view of that mitral valve leaflet. So mitral valve got two leaflet. We have the anterior and the posterior leaflet. And we can see here at the A2 segment of the mitral valve. So this is the mass, okay? So what exactly has happened here? So this is what we call a pseudo aneurysm of the mitral valve. So normally we have a pseudo aneurysm of the LV or RV wall or the left ventricular outflow tract. And this is quite interesting because you have a pseudo aneurysm of the anterior mitral valve leaflet because of this infective endocarditis. And the pseudo aneurysm, interestingly, has also perforated into the left atrium, causing a mitral regurgitation that is going across the mitral valve leaflet into the pseudo aneurysm and into the left atrium. And more uh, clearer, if you see here, this is a view from the side 
of that mitral valve. That's the anterior mitral valve reflex, and that's the posterior mitral valve reflex. And you can see here the pseudo aneurysm, right? That look like a ring here, uh, because of the infective endocarditis. So basically, if you see this kind of thing in your valve, it is ninety nine percent of the time infective endocarditis until proven otherwise. So um, the patient. Uh, this is uh, basically, I wanted to show a typical example of what is called mycotic or infectious aneurysm of the anterior mitral valve reflex because of infective endocarditis. Um, I have shown you how to determine the scallop movement using the mean esophageal four chamber view and by commercial view to determine which leaflet is involved in the uh, infective endocarditis process, which is the A2 scallop of the mitral valve. And basically, in this case, sometimes uh, the 2D is not enough, and the 3D view makes us visualize the pseudo aneurysm much, much better. So, uh, the patient successfully underwent uh, a mitral valve uh, re replacement and uh, actually is doing very well. Uh, so, that is uh, my first case of uh, mycotic aneurysm of the anterior mitral valve reflex. Okay, I want to ask you mm -hmm. when your patient have mycotic. Uh, this uh, embolism, right, causing, um, let's say, uh, an abscess elsewhere. Mm. And of course, the, the treatment of choice is still the mitral valve replacement. And mm. this patient obviously needs a mitral valve replacement because of the severe mitral regurgitation. But mm. how long do you think that you should start the antibiotic before you submit the patient to... Uh, subject the patient to a mitral valve replacement? This is a very uh, interesting and very relevant question and a lot of uh, unnecessary delay in the operating of uh, infective endocarditis. So in general rule, um, easy, easily said and done is a patient that is unstable with uh, refractory heart failure with cardiogenic shock. We don't wait until the antibiotic yes. works. So we go straight away to the uh, operating theater. The problem is, of course, to convince the surgeon to go in. Mm. Because the problem is uh, when they are too ill, they say that the patient is too ill, so they cannot go in. When the patient is well, they ask to continue antibiotic until the yes. patient is very ill, and then the patient, again, not good enough to go for surgery. So yes. that is a step that we do not want to get into. So if, let's say, the patient have what I said is clinical instability, you don't wait for antibiotic, you go straight away. If the patient is stable, the indication to go for early surgery, and we say early surgery is between 10 to 14 days after starting antibiotics, is a big size vegetation, more than 10 millimeter. Someone with a septic embolus uh, and someone with a severe negligent lesion. So all of these are indications to go relatively early. 10 to 14 days of antibiotics. Okay. So uh, we'll just go to our second case now. Mm -hmm. So we have a 56 years old male with history of uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma and radiation 20 years ago. And uh, basically developed severe radiation induced aortic stenosis. So these cases is just for me to introduce to those who are not aware that a certain treatment that is involved in a cancer-related therapy can also have cardiovascular side effect. One of the commonest uh, cardiovascular complication of uh, cancer treatment is radiation-induced valvular heart disease. That usually happens many, many years after the radiation. And that's why sometimes it's uh, very important to get a history of uh, radiation. And this is very pertinent especially when we talk about someone with breast cancer, um, blood malignancy like lymphoma, and also certain kind of uh, lung cancer where they have radiotherapy to their chest wall. So uh, I just wanted to show you after this, the common pattern of radiation-induced uh, valvular heart disease. Um, there are transthoracic echocardiogram here and also transesophageal echocardiogram. So we had an echo here in 2017. This is a pre-operation. And I just wanted to show you a very typical pattern of calcification in radiation-induced uh, valvular heart disease. So basically, the place that you wanted to concentrate is the area here between the body of the anterior mitral valve reflex and the root of the aortic. 
bar. Okay, so this area, so whenever you see a calcification that is continuous from the aortic valve up to the body of the anterior mitral valve leaflet, and a patient with history of radiation, this is radiation-induced uh, valvular heart disease. So this is the pattern that you have to remember. Um, the, it doesn't necessarily cause stenosis. In fact, most of the time, it causes regurgitation more than stenosis. If you look at the picture on the right side, the patient has significant aortic regurgitation and also significant mitral regurgitation here. This is a short axis view of the aortic valve. As you can see, the aortic valve is tri-leaflet, and you can see a calcification of, of all three of the leaflet. Look at the short axis view. You can see that the mitral valve leaflet, the leaflet tips, and the commissure actually opens well. So this is not rheumatic mitral valve disease. This is a this is a apical four chamber view. So this is a Mayo format, the only hospital in which this is inverted. The LV is on the left side and the RV is on the right side. And you can oh. see, yeah, in Mayo Clinic, I'm the only place, uh, I have no idea why they do it, but it's the only place where for an apical four chamber for them is the ballet. Okay. And you can see here, classification of the mitral annulus that can look uh, at first glance like a degenerative mitral annular classification. This is the continuous wave Doppler at the right parasternal view of the aortic valve. And you can see a significant velocity of 4.1 meter per second and mean gradient of 40.1 millimeter mercury, showing severe aortic stenosis. So in this case, I just wanted to show a typical appearance in echocardiogram for radiation-induced valve disease. Oftentimes, because the calcification also in involve the aortic root and the aortic annulus, the coronary artery is also diseased. The ostia of the left main and the ostia of the right coronary artery frequently involved, and a lot of these proximal coronary arteries has also have stenosis. The calcification affects the body of the anterior mitral valve leaflet and also the aortic valve. History of irradiation more than 10 years is typical. The red flag is breast, lung, and blood malignancy. The patient also have high gradient severe aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation. I also do this 3D way of very accurately measuring a mitral valve area. This is what we call a multi planar reconstruction to ensure that we are cutting at the narrowest point of the mitral valve leaflet. So this multi planar reconstruction shows the mitral valve area of 1.9 centimeter squared. So it is only mild mitral stenosis. So there is no mitral surgery done, only aortic valve replacement. Okay, before we go, can we go back to the second case? I have a few questions I want to ask. Okay, now you have so much calcification, right? Yes. Uh, would that make the surgery even more difficult? All right, so uh, the surgery is difficult. The outcome in terms of valvular disease is the worst when we are dealing with radiation-induced uh, valvular disease because they need to debride the, calci the calcium on the mitral valve, especially the aortic valve is not really a problem because a lot of experience to deal with that. With the mitral valve, because the border between the left atrium and left ventricle can be very fragile, when they debride the calcium in the mitral annulus, they take a risk of a rupture of this junction between the left atrium and left ventricle. So you are right, it's a very risky, high-risk operation, but nonetheless can be done successfully. Okay, the other question is, now we have a case where the aortic valve is significant, yet the mitral valve is not significant, it's just mild. Okay, would you, let's say this is, let's say a 50, 45 years old gentleman, would you uh, advise to replace both anyway? Because so basically, basically, we don't know in terms of uh, how fast it's going to be progressing. Basically, as a rule of thumb, mm -hmm. when you're dealing with uh, mixed valvular heart disease or let's say when you're doing any other heart surgery, any valve disease that is moderate or more, you do during the initial index operation moderate or more. So if this were to be moderate mitral stenosis, we have had done both of the valve. But because this is only mild mitral oh, stenosis, yes. therefore we didn't do it. 
Okay, so you didn't do. I don't no. know whether looking back later you <laughs> wish that you yeah, did. Yeah, we might be back again. Yeah. Okay. Last question I have is that do you see this type of radiation um complication? Okay. Um, do you see constr uh, constrictive? Oh, yes. I mean, in fact, we see a lot more constrictive pericarditis than radiation induced valvular heart disease. So, definitely, we see constrictive pericarditis in this situation. Um, so, again, a patient with a history of radiation, if they come with a failure symptoms with, say, pedal edema, raised jugular venous pressure, whose mouth sign, ascites, but the echo show a uh, preserved ejection fraction with respirophasic septal shift and bit to bit septal shudder. So that is an indication of constrictive pericarditis. How do you treat that? Huh? So constrictive pericarditis, uh, if let's say it is radiation induced, the only treatment is pericardiectomy, which is the stripping of the pericardium. Now, if the other constrictive pericarditis, on the other hand, what you can do is to do cardiac MRI and to see whether there is active inflammation of the pericardium. If there is an active inflammation of the pericardium, rather than straight away do a pericardiectomy, you might want to try a three months course of non steroidal anti-inflammatory and also aspirin to see whether you can cure the positive pericarditis without needing pericardiectomy. So you have to remember that pericardiectomy is a very messy operation Mm -hmm. Because often time the pericardium stick very strongly to the heart muscle and the outcome is not very, very good. So it's not a very uh, good outcome operation, but nonetheless, in many, many patients, that is their only option. Okay. Um, can I ask you, is there a chance of a restrict? sorry, a restrictive pattern with radiation? Yes, it's possible, uh, but rare. The restrictive pattern is more common to see with chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy, in which you have uh, uh, heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. Um, so this can happen, but rare with radiation-induced uh, card uh, cardiomyopathy. Okay. We can go on to your next case. So let's look at the question at the end, yeah? Okay. Let's look at the interesting case number three. Uh, basically, this is a case where the transthoracic echocardiogram was done on the 13th of June, 2022. Surgery was done in the 1st of July, 2022. And patient was discharged on the 6th of July, 2022. So we did a span of one week. So look at what we see here. So on the top left, you can see a parasternal long axis view of the heart. And when we look at the left atrium, we can see a mass that is flattering inside the left atrium here. Oh, yes. The question in this case is that the mass is attached on the anterior mitral valve leaflet or the posterior mitral valve leaflet. If you look at the color view on the right side, you can see severe mitral regurgitation that is directed posteriorly. As a rule of thumb, whenever you see a primary mitral valve abnormality, the direction of the jet is opposite to the primary pathology. So in this situation, as the micro regurgitation is directed posteriorly, one would have expect that the mass attached to the anterior rather than posterior micro leaflet. So that's what we think first in this case, because of the posterior directed MR jet, the mass is attached to the anterior micro leaflet. But when we look closely in the zoom view, hmm. then we get a little bit more confused because look like maybe the mass is attached to the posterior microbial yes. But if it's attached to the posterior microbial leaflet, why then is the jet directed posteriorly? If you look at the short axis view, so in transthoracic echocardiogram, the short axis view is an excellent view to determine the which scallops is involved. So just as an orientation, here is lateral and here is medial. So that is an A1, A2, and A3 scallop. This is P1, P2, and P3 scallop. As you can see here, there's a mass attached to the P3 scallops of the mitral valve leaflet. And again, we can see that this is actually a posterior rather than anterior pathology. So how do we explain the posterior pathology with a posteriorly directed mitral regurgitation? 
If you look at the apical four chamber view, you can oh, see right. preserved ejection fraction but torrential severe mitral regurgitation. The ejection fraction is still preserved at 62.9%. Uh, for primary mitral regurgitation, the definition of reduced or depressed ejection fraction is EF that is less than 60%. And the definition of severe left ventricular dysfunction is an ejection fraction that is less than 45%. So very, very different from other illnesses. So this is the way we quantitate the severity of mitral regurgitation. We do something that is called EROA, or effective regurgitant orifice area. So this is the whole of the leakage. And we take a threshold of 0 0.4 centimeters squared as severe. And you can see this patient have a whole size of 0 0.75 centimeters squared. We also look at the volume of the blood leaking to the left atrium, and we take the number 60 mils as significant, and the patient has 78.4 mils of leakage of the mitral valve. So this is severe mitral regurgitation, both with eyeball and color, and also with quantitation. So basically, this patient has infective endocarditis with vegetation at the P3 segment of the mitral valve leaflet. Normally, the jet is directed opposite to the direction of the pathology, but in this case, the jet is directed to the same way. So why is this the case? When I will show you at the touch and surface electrocardiogram, this is interesting because the vegetation is very large, and this actually caused almost total destruction of the posterior mitral valve leaflet. So it's not just flail, the leaflet during systole go down vertically into the left atrium, causing the jet to be directed to the same direction. So if you look here at transesophageal echocardiogram, so this is what we call a two-chamber view. So A1, A2, A3, and P3. If you look at the path, the way the vegetation go, you can see that the vegetation and the leaflet go vertical. That's why the regurgitation goes straight. To that direction rather than to the opposite direction. And finally, with 3D echocardiogram, we can see clearly why the jet is directed posteriorly. So that's the anterior mitral valve leaflet. That is the posterior mitral valve leaflet. And you can see total destruction of the P3 segment of the mitral valve leaflet with vegetation attached to it, causing posteriorly directed mitral regurgitation. Now, even though in this patient, he have big vegetation, surprisingly, they are able to repair and not replace the valve successfully with only trivial mitral regurgitation seen. So this is the mid-esophageal four-chamber view with a trivial mitral regurgitation and two-chamber view again with trivial mitral regurgitation. But I thought you said the posterior mitral valve is already torn. Yes, they, the, the P3 scallop was destroyed. They are still P1 and P2 scallop. So the surgeon actually suture the P2 scallop to the medial commissure and somehow able to repair the valve. And okay, can I so now the, the, the thing is the thing is that during the surgery for um infective endocarditis, okay, the main aim is not only to treat the MR but to get rid of the vegetation. Am I not right? Yeah, you're right. So how do you get rid of the vegetation so confidently without getting rid of the valve? Sometimes uh, the surgeon, uh, this is something that is controversial. Sometimes if they can identify the vegetation and they can separate what they think visually as infected material to non-infected material, they can try to repair the valve. Um, so this depends on the confidence and the competency of the surgeon. But like you said, as a rule, as a general rule, if in this kind of situation, normally you replace rather than repair the valve. Yeah. I mean, looking back, I don't want to go three months, five months later and say that, oh, the vegetation has not been cleared. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's, this is very interesting. That All you right. can repair the valve. Yes. yes. Okay. We do have a case recently of a doctor that come to IJM, young guy with the vegetation of the tricuspid valve, um, also done repair uh, successfully um, because as you know, a tricuspid valve replacement is something that is very tedious because of the low pressure system. Um, mm -hmm. You replace with a mechanical valve, 
they tend to develop clot. So actually repaired successfully, um, I think it has been a year since the repair, uh, so far so good. So I think it is possible, but need a surgery with a very high skill and uh, competency. And this, uh, this, the reason behind his uh, uh, infective endocarditis over the right side is because he's a drug. Ah, we have no idea because he is completely healthy and we do all sort of investigation. So uh, he denied he being a drug user? Yeah, yeah, he's denied being a drug user. He doesn't seem like a drug user. He denied any uh, unsafe uh, sexual practices. And in fact, he doesn't have any indication of retroviral infection. Hmm. Okay, we go on. Right. So we look at the interesting case number four. So we have a 43 years old female. Okay. And uh, this is a parastinal long axis view. What you can see here is that the I think buff look slightly thickened. The movement look abnormal. The wall of the left ventricle is thickened. And you can see that they are turbulent flow systolic across the aortic valve. Okay. There's a zoom view of the aortic valve. You can see a thickened and calcified aortic valve with restricted yeah. opening. We put a color view. We didn't we see a little bit of turbulent flow across the aortic valve in systole, but we didn't see any diastolic flow. So there is no regurgitation. And is but, the patient very tacky? Uh, left, 110 beats per minute. Sorry? 110 beats per minute. Okay. Right, so no obvious IT regurgitation. So this is a short axis view of the aortic valve. Um, normally, uh, very, very difficult sometimes in a calcified valve to determine the number of leaflets. If the patient have IT stenosis, however, and they are relatively young, most of the time it is because of bicuspid aortic valve. Bicuspid aortic valve is actually the commonest congenital heart disease even more common than atrial septal defect. And the most common reason patient that have aortic stenosis undergo aortic valve replacement is actually not degenerative, degenerative trilateral aortic valve, but bicuspid aortic valve. Nevertheless, we are unable to determine the number of liter in this transthoracic echocardiogram of this patient. So this is a apical five chamber view, LA, LV, RV, and IOTA. You can see clearly here that the valve is anotic. You can see calcified yes. and very restricted opening. Again, there is no IOT regurgitation seen here. Again, in apical long axis view, no IOT regurgitation and calcified IOT valve. So the way for us to do uh, assess IOT valve severity is by looking at the velocity across the IOT valve. A velocity of more than 4 meter per second usually denotes severe aortic stenosis. A mean gradient that is more than 40 millimeter mercury and the aortic valve area that is less than 1 centimeter squared is what we call a straightforward high gradient severe aortic stenosis. Mean gradient more than 40 and aortic valve area that is less than 1. Many times, however, we do see an entity called area gradient mismatch in which the gradient is less than 40 millimeter mercury but the area is also less than one centimeter squared. There are many reasons for this. Namely, either the patient can have low flow across the aortic valve, causing low gradient, even though the aortic valve uh, stenosis is severe. So we have a few entity, classical low flow, low gradient severe aortic stenosis, paradoxical low flow, low gradient severe aortic stenosis, and also normal flow, low gradient severe aortic stenosis. So this is very common. And the way to go approach these three different entities is different and you have to be knowledgeable about that. I say that because in this case, the entity is rarer. When we use a continuity equation, so continuity equation is based on the principle that whatever go in into the IoT valve, uh, into the LVOT, is the same that go out through the IoT valve. Yeah. So therefore, we can calculate the aortic valve area in this case of 1.21 centimeter squared. So the aortic valve area is not severe. It's more than one. But when you look at the continuous wave Doppler across the aortic valve, we see a mean gradient that is more than 40, which is 67.8 millimeter mercury. So this is rarer. So we have area gradient mismatch in which the gradient is low and the aortic valve area is low. 
We also have an entity called reverse area gradient mismatch, in which the attic buff area is more than one, but yet the mean gradient is more than 40 millimeter mercury. Why is this so? The most common cause is because of high flow state. Normally, a concomitant is someone with big body surface area, someone with high flow because of hyperthyroidism, or someone with an unused AV fistula. So, does this patient have a concomitant high flow? When we look at the color, we see obviously the patient does not have concomitant severe IT decision. So, that is not the explanation. The patient is also not hyperthyroid and the body size is normal. So why this reverse area gradient mismatch? So from trans thoracic echocardiogram, we actually proceed to trans esophageal echocardiogram. And finally, in trans esophageal echocardiogram, we can see clearly that this is a bicuspid aortic valve. Mm -hmm. You can see a non coronary cast here. And you can see a fused right and left coronary cast with a refi connecting these two leaflets. This is the most common type of tricuspid IT valve. We call it a Sievers 1 right and left fusion. A tips on determining the number of leaflet is to look at the opening during systole. Mm. If the opening is triangular, so it is trilated. If the opening is oval, it is more likely to be bicuspid. So the patient have bicuspid IT valve. So a less well-known fact is one of the main reasons of reverse aortic mismatch is bicuspid aortic valve. Why? Because in bicuspid aortic valve, when you have aortic stenosis, sometimes the turbulent flow rather than central is eccentric. And this eccentricity actually hit the aortic wall very near the aortic root. And the eccentricity caused higher gradient for a given aortic valve area. So, for example, in a normal aortic stenosis with a central jet, an aortic valve area of less than 1 mm mercury, uh, less than 1 cm squared gives a mean gradient that is 40 mm, more than 40 mm mercury. But in bicuspid valve with eccentric jet, a big aortic valve of 1.2 can already give a higher gradient than 40 mm mercury. So this is the apical long axis view and the, on the deep transgastric view. So this is an interesting view that can be difficult for someone who just learned to do transesophageal echocardiogram. So this view is important to assess the Doppler of the aortic view in the transesophageal echo where you can get a parallel direction between the flow of the stenotic jet and also your ultrasound probe. This is basically the, the main image that I wanted to show. You can see that the jet actually go eccentric and hitting the IO2 bar. That is why you have the reverse area gradient mismatch. So we finally get the answer for this patient. This patient have a fusion of right and left coronary cusp with bicuspid valve. There is no IOT regurgitation. In this case, even though the area is more than one centimeter squared, the mean gradient is more than 40 because of bicuspid valve and the eccentric jet as illustrated on the last image. So in summary, bicuspid valve with eccentric stenotic jet is one of the commonest cause of reverse area gradient mismatch. And I think this entity needs to be learned. Uh, people need to be aware about this entity because uh, sometimes this will come to your echo lab. Okay, now we go back to that case because I got a question. Um, I want to ask you, in this case, do we take it as severe then? Do we take the gradient or do we take the area? So in this case, we take the area rather than the gradient. Okay. Because so we, we, we do study, me and my colleague in IJN do study. And uh, in this study, we notice that those with reverse area gradient mismatch, even if they undergo operation, the outcome is the best out of all the others, uh, meaning that it's more likely that this doesn't represent a too severe rather than a, rather this is a moderate aortic stenosis. Okay. Now, the second question I want to ask is, why is it that uh, bicuspid valve are so prone to degeneration compared to a tricuspid valve? This is because of the mechanism of the flow. They do a 4D cardiac MRI flow analysis. And it's just the physics is rather complicated. 
-hmm. but the flow through bicuspid valve is not as efficient as the flow through a trileaflet aortic valve. Because of this inefficient flow, there's a lot of friction in the opening of the valve, causing calcification and degeneration of bicuspid valve to occur more frequently than trileaflet aortic valve. Second reason is that genetically, the bicuspid valve has a easier formation of osteoblasts. The osteoblast is basically akin to bone formation, and okay. this can also cause rapid calcification of the valve. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, next case. All right, let's go to the next case. So this is a case of 51 years old female. You can see at the parastin long axis view, we can see a borderline ejection fraction of 46.2%. We can see a calcified aortic valve. Doctor, can I ask one more question? Can. If the patient has a, let's say, a, a gradient over the LVOT, yes. will it make a difference to our calculation of the aortic stenosis yes. gradient? Yes. yes, and this becomes very, very complicated when you have a both, we have a gradient in series. So if you have a gradient in the LVOT and you have gradient in the aortic valve, there is really no way for you to separate these two gradient. So in this situation, usually I didn't do quantity equation. Sorry, you are lagging. Am I so, lagging? Can you, can you hear me? Okay, I can hear you now. All right. So whenever you have uh, obstruction in series, in which you have a stop, obstruction in the LVOT and the obstruction in the aortic valve, it is very difficult to do a quantity equation and to calculate the aortic valve area in this case. So in this situation, normally I will do planning my tree to calculate the aortic valve, to, 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 to uh, look at the aortic valve area rather than using a quantity equation. I see. Okay, thank you. Right, so this is another case where you can also see a thickened left ventricular wall. We can see a calcified aortic valve and a thickened mitral valve. You can see here uh, turbulent flow across the aortic valve, so the patient has some aortic stenosis and also severe aortic regurgitation and also yeah. mild mitral regurgitation. So we have a zoom view of the aorta. We get the LVOT with a radius of 1.15 cm. We need the radius because that radius is important to calculate the aortic valve area via continuity equation. So basically here is best to illustrate the way we the principle is whatever going into the aortic valve through the LVOT is the same as the one that go out the aortic valve. Mm. So pi r squared times the LVOT VTI is equal to AV VTI times the effective orifice area. So you just rearrange the equation and you get your aortic valve area. Don't worry, continuity equation is valid even in the presence of concomitant aortic regurgitation. Mm. Now, when you look at the short axis view, we can see that. Again, as we see with the previous case, I am unable to determine the number of aortic valve leaflet here because of the heavy calcification. But it and looks tricuspid to me. Okay, so it looks tricuspid to you. Yes. Uh, so I, 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 I agree with you. I think uh, if you want me, you you know, you put a gun on my head and want me to get, <laughs> um, I will say that this is a trileaflet aortic valve as well. Um, but uh, the patient is relatively young. I think she's... Oh. Uh, uh, I think 50. So very unlikely for a trilateral aortic valve to degenerate as early as this. So this is an apical long axis view. Again, you can see that the significant aortic regurgitation with mild mitral regurgitation. We look at the Doppler here. Again, here we can see that the aortic valve area from continuity equation is 1.1 centimeter squared, yet the mean gradient is more than 40 millimeter mercury. We have the same situation as we see in the previous case, where we have a reverse area gradient mismatch in which the mean gradient is more than 40, even though the aortic valve area is more than 1. Why in this case this is so? In this case, we have a ready explanation because the patient has concomitant severe aortic regurgitation. So I therefore, see. the patient has high flow across the aortic valve and reverse area gradient mismatch. It is also possible that this patient also have a concomitant bicuspid aortic valve. But as you can see from the short axis view, this might be unlikely because the shape looks like this is a trilateral aortic valve. So this is a descending aorta. So this is very important in the assessment of aortic regurgitation 
because you want to see a backward flow in the descending iota. So this is what we call a diastolic flow reversal. Usually in normal people without dilatation, either there are no flow backward or there's very little flow at the beginning. But in patients with severe dilatation, you can see a reversal of flow throughout the whole of diastole, like in this case here. Even more strikingly and more specific, if you can have reversal of flow in the abdominal iota, this is much more specific. Basically, you can bring it to the bank that the patient has severe aortic dilatation. And as you can see here, the forward flow across abdominal iota, and this is the backward flow across abdominal iota, which is the hollow diastolic flow reversal in the abdominal iota, suggesting indeed that is, this is a very severe aortic dilatation. So what is my thought about this case? So this is a relatively young 51 years old man with severe IOT dilatation, taking LVOT 1.15 centimeters, I think VTI of 120 centimeters, and peak velocity of more than four, and mean gradient of, we got a reverse area gradient mismatch with AVA of 1.1 and mean gradient of 51. So this is the reverse area gradient mismatch at its gnosis that is easily explained due to concomitant high flow of severe IT regurgitation. There is a slight reduction in duration fraction of 46.2% in mild to moderate functional MR. Now, because I am still unsure on the number of leaflet, I proceed with trust esophageal echocardiogram. So this is a mid-esophageal long axis view. So you can see that the one of the leaflet is classified and the other one is restrictive. And you can see significant aortic regurgitation. We measure the vena contracta, which is the neck of the aortic valve uh, regurgitation, and that's six that is more than six millimeter. So this is indeed severe aortic regurgitation, right? However, we have a surprise when we look at the short axis view, AOPA view of the aortic valve. Okay, this is actually not a trilipid aortic valve. Rather, this is a unicuspid aortic valve i.e. a uh, aortic valve with a you single leaflet. Speak, uh, oh. yes. Because what happened here is that you have a fusion of this leaflet. Hold on. We fused like... with this leaflet and fused with that leaflet. Okay? All, oh. all these three leaflets. Are you lagging? Or am I lagging? It's really nice here, but I'm not sure whether it's lagging. Are you okay now? Ah, we are okay now. Okay. So... These three leaflets here actually uh -huh. connected to each other. Okay, these are connected to each other by a referee there and there. This is the only opening. So this is a unique aspect IOT valve. Um, and this unique aspect IOT valve actually cause a concomitant severe IOT stenosis and a reverse area gradient mismatch IOT regurgitation. In this situation, I don't think unique aspect valve actually contribute to the reverse area gradient mismatch. I think that is because of concomitant severe IOT regurgitation. Nonetheless, it is interesting because this is a commonest type of unicuspid valve. The other type of unicuspid valve is very rare in which you have a pure unicuspid valve which you truly have a single leaflet without any fusion of the leaflet. So my final thought on this case, so the key TEE clears the diagnosis of functional unicuspid valve where all the valves are connected by refill. The aortic stenosis jet is relatively central and therefore the most likely cause of reverse area gradient mismatch is the concomitant survey aortic regurgitation. And the patient successfully underwent aortic valve replacement. So, so, I think, so for example, if you have not done the TE and then you are so confident like me, you would think it's a tricuspid valve, you may make a diagnosis of let's say chronic rheumatic heart disease. Hmm. Okay, I mean the end and uh, management, of course, the final management is still the same. Right. It's very interesting. I never heard of unicuspid valve, to be honest. Yes, we have the uh, unicuspid, bicuspid, trileaflet, and quadricuspid. I've never seen five leaflet. I don't know what to call it. What is what we call quadricuspid? Uh, five leaflet. I'm not sure. So I think, Dr. Betty, we have five cases. Shall we stop here? Uh, I think so. We can stop yeah. here. So yeah. uh, there are some questions. Uh, I think let's take some questions. Uh, where is it? Huh? Just now, this one. Um, okay, from Zoom, yeah. Uh, the attendance has been great. Uh, Dr. Johan asks, 
How has the role of echocardiography evolved in recent years as a diagnostic tool? And what are the some what are some of the key advancements that have improved in the diagnostic cap capability? Oh. So I think it has advanced by leaps and bounds uh, since the era of, I think they start with the B mode. In B mode echocardiogram, you only see a point, just point here, point there. And then after that, you got M mode. In M mode, it's a, not it's a 2D, it's, not, it's a 1D images where you can uh, see the movement but not really a 2D image. Then after that, you got 2D. So we are all familiar with 2D. This is what we do day in and day out in all the lab. After that, we have 3D. And 3D now has really come into prime time, especially in transesophageal echocardiogram. As I show you in my cases, uh, we can see almost exactly the same thing what the surgeon can see when they open the heart. In fact, we can actually pinpoint within a millimeter where exactly is the pathology. So we can see the ruptured cord. We can determine where is the scallop. We can tell whether the patient have abscess, pseudoaneurysm, fistula. In fact, if you talk about transthoracic echocardiogram 3D, we can actually use 3D to calculate ejection fraction with much greater accuracy than 2D echocardiography. We also have now something that is called speckle tracking imaging, in which we can track the speckle, which is a white uh, dots that is reflected by the heart muscle and look at the function of the heart muscle with more specificity and sensitivity so that we can diagnose this function earlier. So for example, ejection fraction of 55% might seem normal, but if you use speckle tracking and you get a lower value than normal, for example, negative 15%, you actually have a subclinical LV dysfunction. So you have 3D echocardiogram and you have strained speckle tracking. And finally, now, of course, is the area of artificial intelligence. So we, a lot of people have incorporated artificial intelligence into the echocardiogram. To give you an example, nowadays, in order to determine the true severity of atrial stenosis, we might need to do a CT calcium score. We might need to do a low-dose diopotomic stress echocardiogram. But with artificial intelligence, by virtue of storing hundreds or thousands of a pattern of IT valve classification, Rather than needing to do all these tests, the computer can just look at the degree of classification and from then onwards determine the true degree of severity of aortic stenosis. Okay. For example, all this uh, capability to assess the pathology to the very spot, does it help the surgeon? Oh, yes. It helped them a lot. It helped them to uh, anticipate uh, what operation to do, for example, whether it is repair or replacement. It made them anticipate the complication that can go after operation. Yeah. For example, if they were to put the valve, will this valve develop, if they were to repair a valve, will this uh, valve develop systolic entry motion of the mitral valve post operation? For example, if someone wants to put a mechanical valve in the mitral valve, will this cause obstruction of the left ventricular outflow tract. All of this answer can be answered by 3D echocardiogram. So it is extremely, extremely useful. Okay. Dr. Suzy asks, could you elaborate the role of electrocardiography in the early detection and monitoring of heart disease, especially with patients with risk factor or genetic predisposition? So definitely. Like I said, before this, you use ejection fraction to detect left ventricular dysfunction. i give an example. If you are thinking about chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy, you actually can use echocardiogram to monitor the chemotoxicity to the heart. So one thing you can do is that you can do echocardiogram every three months and see whether there's any reduction in ejection fraction. If there's any reduction in ejection fraction, you can actually start to institute anti-failure therapy or try to modify the chemotherapy regime. But by just looking into ejection fraction, it might not be sufficient because when the ejection fraction come down, it might be too late to intervene already. So nowadays, we use speckle tracking. Rather than waiting for the ejection fraction to come down, we look whether the speckle tracking value come down before the ejection fraction. So we can actually intervene earlier. Another example is people with bicuspid aortic valve. Again, we can do echocardiogram early, and we can look at the bicuspid aortic valve, see the pattern of classification, and maybe predict by using artificial intelligence, how fast this bicuspid valve will progress. 
We also can use echocardiogram to look at the flow across the aortic valve and to see whether this flow have any relationship with the progression. So that's just a many different example of how we can follow the progression of heart disease. Um, but there are many, many others. Uh, these two questions that were asked deal with general, general, generalities. And I do felt that uh, this is an exciting field uh, for a budding cardiologist um, rather than uh, you know, always just interested in, for example, uh, angiogram and angioplasty. Okay, um, Dr. Sunita, okay, Dr. Christina spoke about pentacuspid. Pentacuspid, okay, so that is the five. Wow, well, I think she's answering my, my, my question. Oh, I see, I see, okay. So Dr. Sunita asked, what's the percentage of EF that is considered normal? Okay, using, and, yeah. using guideline now, if you use guideline now, for female is more than 54%, for male is more than 52%. That is guideline now, 54, 52. However, after the wage study, the wage study is the study because the, these all numbers that we are using now is actually derived from mainly Caucasian and black population in a Western country, not uh, Asian country. And many of these numbers also were derived from a not good quality echocardiogram with a lot of force shortening and no standardization. So now, I think in the near future, maybe in one year or in month's time, the percentage will change, i.e. for male, more than 57% and for female, more than 58%. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Kumarasamy said, um, okay, thank you, thank you for the excellent talk. But he want to ask you, what? When do you do? When do you recommend a patient for dobutamine stress test? Oh, I think so, that. Okay. You want me to answer that? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I think this is not something not to do with echocardiogram. So, if yes. you want to do dobutamine stress test, so basically, stress test is just you know you want to stress the heart, and you want to see whether there's any ischemia. So normally the best thing is of course to do treatment stress test because you can also assess the patient's physical capability and stamina. But sometimes the patient cannot run or cannot cycle because of physical limitation. So in this situation, we do recommend dobutamine stress test for a normal ischemic test. However, we can also use dobutamine to do a stress echocardiogram. So we can do a dobutamine stress echocardiogram to assess something that is called viability. Whenever we see a regional wall motion abnormality and want to see whether that region is infected, hibernating, stun, or done ischemic cardiomyopathy, you can do dobutamine stress echocardiogram. In a patient with classical low flow, low gradient severe stenosis, you can do low, low dose dobutamine stress echocardiogram to determine whether this is a true severe atic stenosis or pseudo severe atic stenosis. Okay, I think we will stop here. And of course, we will continue the series next year. Uh, I've already spoken to Aslan if he has agreed. So we will probably do three or four again next year because it is there's a, so much to learn. Just so much. I mean, I've been practicing cardiology for 30 years, but every time I learn new things when I listen to your talk. Okay, Christina saw said actually can echo be a non-invasive test for coronary artery blockages. Yes, you can do stress echo. Uh, it is not uh it's non-invasive, um, uh, it's objective. Uh it's not something that I really enjoy doing. <laughs> Especially with this uh I mean with City Angel being so readily available, I think. Stress echo is hardly used these days. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think so too. If you do uh, stress echo cardiogram, I think it's uh, very useful. I like to do stress echo cardiogram. Uh, very accurate if let's say it's read by a very expert person. Yes. So if it's, the stress echo is read by, by me, it is 100% accurate. Yeah, I hardly do at all. Um, because you really need an eye to see the 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 hypo uh, hypokinetic region yeah, hypokinetic and it's quite difficult for me yeah, yeah it is difficult. Yes, I don't do enough okay thank you very much
Thank you, thank you. Uh, for your invitation. Hey, thanks. Uh. It was so good. Uh. I was thank so you. enjoy it. Hold on. Uh. I